a listener's guide to Maurice Ravel's La Valse. In 1919, ballet impresario and artistic director of Paris's famed Ballet Russe, Sergei Diaghilev, requested a new composition for his ballet company from French composer Maurice Ravel. Diaghilev had earned a reputation for seeking out Europe's leading composers and Ravel, assumed by the press to be the successor to the recently deceased Claude Debussy as leader of the French musical scene, seemed the perfect choice. Diaghilev and Ravel had collaborated once before, 13 years earlier, with the production of the Greek myth of Daphnis and Chloe. That production was fraught with artistic disagreements between the two men, with Ravel insisting on the supremacy of the music and Diaghilev insisting on the supremacy of the dance. Each requested change to the score led to weeks of argument and negotiation, with the result that the premiere was delayed for three years. Undoubtedly, Diaghilev went into this new collaboration with some trepidation. Nevertheless, a few months after the request was made, Ravel was prepared to present a new composition. Francis Poulenc, who was present at this presentation, reports that upon hearing a two-piano version of the new composition, performed by Ravel and Marcel Mayer, Diaghilev declared, Ravel, it's a masterpiece, but it's not a ballet. He described it as a portrait of a ballet, a painting of a ballet. Ravel, insulted, immediately left the room, and the piece was never staged by the Ballet Russe. The enmity that existed between the two men lingered for the rest of their lives, even resulting at one point in a challenge to a duel. Ravel reports having a long fascination with the sound and rhythmic energy of the waltz. As early as 1906, he had begun work on an orchestral tone poem that he originally entitled Vienna, that was to be a sort of tribute to the Viennese waltz. The piece lingered while he worked on other projects. The idea of using the waltz as the basis for a composition first played itself out in Valses Nobel et Sentimental of 1911, which emulated the waltz style of Austrian composer Franz Schubert. Diaghilev's 1919 invitation motivated Ravel to start work in earnest on his long-neglected Vienna, which would take as its inspiration the music of Johann Strauss II, the Waltz King. After the piece's rejection by Diaghilev, Ravel set to work turning it back into a tone poem, or a single movement work for orchestra that depicts a singular story or idea. Calling it instead a poem choreographique, the piece received its public premiere in Paris on December 12, 1920. The piece is perhaps best understood in two parts. The first part begins with a quiet introduction with fragments of melodies that use waltz-like rhythms coalescing into a coherent waltz theme. Ravel uses a sort of ABA form for the presentation of this waltz theme. The opening section presents the main thematic material in the violins and high winds. It is followed by a loud orchestral tutti, mainly characterized by the use of brass and percussion, that opens and closes the middle section. The return of the opening material is fragmented with the waltz rhythms appearing in a way that makes one think that they are fighting against being pulled apart. Twice, Ravel creates a buildup of tension that gets interrupted, leaving the music with the sensation of remaining unfulfilled. The music returns to the opening texture of the introduction for the beginning of the second part of the piece. All of the themes from the first part appear again in the same order, but each has been disfigured, usually by placing them in a different orchestral instrument, against a different accompanimental figure, or through the use of rapid and unexpected changes in key. 
the composition then launches into its final buildup. It is almost as if, having been unable to fulfill the promises of the two previous buildups, the music needed to go back to the beginning and take a new running start at this final crescendo. This buildup culminates in a coda that takes the form of a dance macabre, or dance of death, characterized by loud, chaotic rhythms, dynamic contrasts, and wild crescendi and decrescendi. The piece ends abruptly with a non-waltz-like unison rhythm. Since its composition, La Valse has generated speculation as to the meaning that Ravel was intending to portray. Ravel included a brief description of the time and place of the composition setting in the score. Numerous critics and commentators have seen deeper meaning in the piece. Coming so rapidly after the conclusion of World War I, in which Ravel served in the French army against the Austrians, many people have heard the piece as a representation of the decline of the Austro-Hungarian Empire in its apparent disintegration into chaos. Others have heard more individual stories. The piece was eventually set as a ballet, first by Mademoiselle Rubinstein's ballet company in Antwerp in 1926, and later by Georges Balanchine in 1951, and by Frederick Ashton for the Royal Ballet in 1958. Each of these ballets presents a story of tragic love playing itself out through the increasingly chaotic and intense dance of a waltz, which seems to be increasingly spinning out of control. The Balanchine choreography symbolizes a woman's dance with death. Balanchine indicated that he had once seen a notation on the score in Ravel's hand about dancing on the edge of a volcano. For his part, Ravel steadfastly rejected these readings of his work. It is easy to read a tragic program into the work because Ravel left so many tantalizing clues that suggest a deeper meaning. First, there is the oral sensation of the music pulling itself apart into chaos through fragmenting rhythms, unexpected key changes, odd leaps in the themes, and frequent thematic interruptions. Second, some of these interruptions suggest a sinister outcome. Lastly, the final rhythmic unison, perhaps, emulates the sound of a machine gun. Nevertheless, Ravel was steadfast in his denial of a meaning beyond the portrayal of the rhythmic and melodic essence of the Viennese waltz. La Valse is compelling because of Ravel's skill at creating the feeling of a waltz by focusing on what is most essential about its style. Despite the composer's denials, one can clearly hear a narrative of disintegration into chaos in the work. Finally, Ravel's use of harmony, key, and instrumentation is nothing short of brilliant, creating a work that changes colors with every hearing.